what I'd like to do in this segment is talk a little bit about designing a secure wireless network. This is going to consist of placement and things that we can do in order to make the network as well as the wireless a little more secure. So the objectives are described the basic principles of security design and obviously the basic principles of security design is keep the bad guys out. We want to teach our users to be as safe, as secure, as thinking as possible. Define network segmentation and tell how it can be used in WLANs. We talked a little bit about that in the last section. Segmentation and segmentation can be done at either layer two or at layer three. The layer two segmentation we do with the uh, collision domains and the layer three segmentation we're going to get done with the broadcast domains at a, at a higher level of the OSI model layer three instead of layer two. Ways in which wireless hardware can be located securely this gets to be a situation to where you don't want users to be able to do that. We put in a wireless room one time and unfortunately kinda did and kinda didn't uh, get the access point out of the total reach of the students. So when an individual had a problem connecting logging in probably which wasn't the wireless issues this individual decided to just reset the access point once you reset the access points you go back to the defaults when you go back to the defaults it no longer works on the network so we had a real issue there go back and reconfigure the AP uh, and then put it in a more secure location out of sight out of mind uh, kind of a situation uh, in a high spot Lock, locked away where the users could no longer fool with it themselves. Uh, describe the steps that can be taken to protect wireless devices, the devices themselves, not necessarily the information, kind of like what I was talking about in the previous one. So the five key security principles here are layering, limiting, diversity, obscurity and simplicity. Obscurity may or may not be something that you want to trust implicitly. It's something that is kind of handy but is not what you really want to depend on because if, you, if you're if you depending upon security by obscurity somebody's going to figure it out and your obscurity is not going to work for them. The simplicity we tend to out complex ourselves. We make it so complex that nobody really knows what's going on and we can actually fool ourselves into thinking something's secure and it's not secure. This goes back to one of my theories is when you do some of this stuff configure it go back and try it out see if it actually works. I see so many people say oh yeah it's done now well did you try it? No I just know that it works. Well try it out. See if it actually does work. Layering, defense in depth it's kind of a military term that we would use to have lots of different layers of of uh, security in that. In the military terms, those securities we have in a, in a naval context, you would have uh, maybe long-term uh, airplanes out, and then you would have your destroyers around and those things, and down to where you, if you're protecting a carrier, down to where you got to the the, the weapon systems actually on the uh, machine itself. So we do a similar thing with uh, network security. Diversity, this goes into the if we have all of one equipment manufacturer, once somebody figures out the way to compromise that one piece of equipment, they can then use the same techniques to compromise all the pieces of equipment. So what we would like to do is have a number of different types of equipment so that we can uh, have a situation that one technique won't work on everything. The issue here becomes obviously training and the networkers have to have a broader knowledge in order to do that. So in layering 
should be created in layers, make it unlikely that the attacker possesses the tools and skills to break through all of the layers of defense. And what we can have here are things like, I mean, we can start out with physical security of fence around the building, uh, placement of the access points so that we're not broadcasting outside the building, shielding on the windows so that we have the Faraday uh, film to keep the information from escaping the building. Maybe a Faraday cage around the building of some sort. A Faraday cage is something that's going to prevent our wireless signal from leaking out. So we want to have numerous layers in order to do that. Layers can be things like the strong door locks, the fence, those sorts of things, antivirus uh, software, uh, strong passwords. Uh, I have a slide a little bit later on the antivirus, and, and it kind of surprised me the number of machines in the world that are unprotected, um, and it runs to somewhere almost 25%. So people aren't using the resources that are available to them. Strong passwords, they're kind of a pain, and you know, should change them frequently, obviously, but the objective of a password is not that it's going to be uncrackable because there's no such thing. It's just that by the time it gets cracked, the password is no longer useful for the individual that now has that. But the problem with the layer approach is that they all have to be properly coordinated to provide a cohesive security perimeter. If we do not coordinate them properly, then we can have an issue. And with this one, I'd go back to maybe a football analogy for all you sports fans, a quarterback-receiver combination. If they're not coordinated, the quarterback can look really silly by throwing a pass to the opposing team instead of to his receiver. If the receiver cuts inside and the quarterback expects him to cut outside. So the layers have to be coordinated and everybody that's managing the layers all got to be on the same page to do these things. Limiting is just limiting access to information. It's going to reduce the threat against it obviously and we can do that with permissions a number of different ways to do that. Only those who use the data should have access to it. And this goes back to uh, the concept of minimum permissions so that we only give users the permissions that they need to actually do their job. Only give them access to the resources that they need to actually do their job. Should be limited to what that person needs to know in order to do their job. Uh, more than placing a password on a system, it means that you're allowing particular users to access systems. So we have to have a plan who needs it, and we have to define what each job needs in order to be successful in the execution of their duties. Should have the least amount of information necessary to do their jobs and no more, and that's basically what each of those bullets has said in this whole slide is. We want to have give users a minimum amount of information. Diversity, so it's, it is related to layering, related to layering in that we're going to be connecting different devices to gathering. The layers must be different. And here is di it's diverse. Uh, it, we may have a 3Com, and then that will connect to a Cisco, for instance. And if we are able to compromise the 3Com, then we have to use different techniques in order to uh, get to the uh, get through the Cisco. If, uh, if, if we penetrate one layer, can't use the same techniques to break, break through all the layers. And that kind of makes sense. The problem with that is it becomes a training issue and the number of technicians, the broad base of knowledge that your networkers are going to have to have in order to manage each of these equipments. Although the process is the same on each of the devices, a router is a router is a router. The way that you actually configure it is different from each of the manufacturers. Using the diverse layers, breaching one wireless security layer doesn't compromise the entire system. So we do want to do those things. Diverse layers and just layers in general is going to give us those. Diversity in a, in a transitional security model which was discussed a couple of, of uh, 
videos ago is implementation of both MAC address filtering and DHCP restrictions. Yes, we can do that. Is it going to really provide defense against a dedicated hacker? No, because they're going to sit out and watch and see once they've gotten close enough to get the signal, they'll find a valid MAC address. They'll find a valid IP address and use those to compromise the system. Obscurity. Obscuring what goes in, on inside a system or organization uh, and avoiding a clear patterns of behavior. And I think the book talks about the changing of the guard uh, at a bank. If we're going to try to break into the bank, for instance, we'd like to know when the guards are uh, changing over. I guess that's got an upside and a downside. There would be two there, but they would be focused on uh, one relieving the other instead of guarding the bank. If we then have a random changing of the guard time, then we're unable to predict when's the best time to try to do that. And then if we have some randomization and if we don't know what's there, it makes uh, attacks from the outside more difficult. For instance, you don't want to compromise your internal IP addressing scheme because once we have that then we can use other techniques to try to get into the uh, internal network to use those schemes. And you need to keep checking to see if that happens. We found a couple of years ago that the copy, the, the installation of the squid proxy server that we were using actually did reveal the internal IP address. Somebody that was dedicated that really wanted those addresses could observe the traffic and see what our internal addressing scheme was. So what we want to do is make it mysterious to those on the outside as to what actually goes on on the inside. Uh, the wireless information security don't advertise the what security is in place uh, and don't use predictable passwords Jim. Don't use predictable passwords is easy to say and there are softwares that will assign passwords to users. Uh, that probably means they're going to write them down. If they write them down and keep them secret that's probably going to be okay. Uh, don't advertise what security is in place and one of the things to consider here is when people are advertising for jobs or advertising a job. If you look at the one ads, they'll tell you what equipment they have because they'll tell you what skills they want in the people that they're trying to hire. So you can watch the one ads in some cases and find out what an individual company has in place. Little things like that. Security by obscurity, uh, too weak. It's not something that you should depend on. Uh, for the only thing that you do, is it can be one component of what happens in this thing. The simplicity, uh, information security is weak, is, is by its very nature is complex and I think it's weak because we have humans involved and we don't always listen to what we're saying, don't always realize the impact of what we're saying and somebody that's observing can take different elements from different users and, and find out what's going on. But information security is complex. It's not a simple thing. We have all these different layers and the diversity that we're going to use here. It can be hard to understand, hard to troubleshoot, hard to feel secure. We need to be able to test our systems, to understand what goes on in our systems. If one part of it fails, what's the impact on the other parts? And that's something that you just have to map out and see how it does work, how they work together. And one of the things to do is try your security, test it out. Do your own penetration testing. Have part of the system fail and see if your system is still secure. Secure system should be simple enough for those on the inside to understand and use it, but complex enough so that th those on the outside don't really know what's going on, but it's going to appear complex on the outside. Our, our large benefit from, uh, from security. And this is uh, the summary slide, layering, multiple layers of defenses, 
that surround the information, antivirus, strong passwords, door locks, uh, good sec physical security plans, uh, rooms are locked when they're not in use. And I think that they should be locked and the lights on so that it's easy to look into the room and make somebody that's there feel insecure in case another, if somebody on patrol walks by. Limiting or restrict access to the information and diversity to different types of defenses, different types of equipment. Uh, obscurity, uh, hide anything that could be useful to the attacker. Um, a lot of that is hide the infrastructure. And that includes, you know, giving away the IP addressing scheme, uh, any kind of drawings that you might have. Be careful where you throw them away. Shred all of that information. Simplicity uh, should not be confusing to the people that are managing the system. Uh, be sure you understand your equipment. If you buy a new firewall, be sure you understand how to configure that firewall before you put it into production. And this over here says use multiple firewalls. Uh, that would work in multiple firewalls from different manufacturers so that if one's compromised, the other one isn't. Segmentation. Uh, divides the network into smaller units and we can segment subnet. We can segment, and our true segmentation is a layer two, and we can subnet to break it into smaller uh, network parts or components. It's a subset of a larger network and that also makes it a little more difficult for somebody if somebody does compromise the network. Now they've got to figure out where in the network, if they get into the into the network, where in the network are they actually going to need to be in order to uh, get the information that they need. Reduces the amount of traffic on the network. It can do that. Uh, we talked about layer two, that only the traffic on the one side is going to uh, be seen by the switch and in the next segment the one that the bridges are connecting together will only get the traffic if the MAC address is there. Same thing happens, similar thing happens in routed networks. Broadcasts are only on the network itself. A uh, router will stop the broadcast and the traffic that needs to go someplace only that traffic is routed out by the router itself so we can reduce the amount of traffic on other segments of the network by breaking it down into smaller portions. A non-deterministic networking, this is going to be Ethernet, the devices share the same media and, and send a packet at any time. Uh, I've also heard this called a probabilistic network and I say it's because you're probably going to get on the network. The These things do share the same media they can send a packet anytime that they want to as long as the media is free. The carrier sends multiple access collision detection, CSMACD, uh, Ethernet. What we do is listen and if the media is free we send the packet and once we send the packet we listen to see if somebody else had the same, some other station had the same uh, idea at the same time to see if there's a collision. If we do we send out a jam packet to tell everybody that there's been a collision, wait for a random period of time and do it again. Random period of time because if you do a fixed period of time then you're just going to have the same collision. So they share the same media. Collision two packets are sent at the same time we talked about that. Collision domain is an area that encompasses all the network devices that can cause collisions. In the wireless world we don't use collision detection, we lose use collision avoidance, which means that the uh, station has to have permission to send and only one station is sending at a time. In the wired we can have collisions if we have hubs, for instance, everything is is using the same media. When we get into the switches, the higher level equipment, switches create each port creates its own collision domain so we affect effectively don't have collisions when we use switches. And collisions, the, the busier the network, the more likely the collision. And one of the things that I like to think about is let's put people in a big parking lot, for instance, and we'll use, uh, we'll use bumper cars so that we're not messing up your car. <clears throat> and you blindfold them and tell them to drive around. If you only have two drivers and you put them at opposite ends of a very large parking lot, 
they may go in all sorts of different directions, but the odds of having a collision is fairly remote. If you put 150 bumper cars in the same area, the odds of having a collision go up significantly. Same thing happens with networking. As we add more stations to the system, the odds of a collision happening increase tremendously. When collisions happen, the network slows down. So by creating these segments, we have fewer machines on each segment. We reduce the odds of having the collisions. And this is a single large collision domain. What we would like to do is to break this thing up into smaller, smaller, obviously, collision domains so that we don't have the issue. If we, if we did break it up, fewer would be better. And this one shows collision domains. Uh, a couple of different ones here that we have now created so that we can uh, have less problem getting access to the media because there are fewer machines in each of these things and then if these in fact are switches each port will be a collision domain as we go across this thing. But collision domains again are layer 2 devices are what are going to happen here. So layer 2 device collision domains. If we break it up with a router we're going to be uh, working at layer 3. Network segment and a subnet are different. A segment is created by connecting equipment to a physical device and subnets are done by grouping things together on the in the internet protocol and the IP addresses. Quite honestly, you, we create the devices that we use today, principally switches are going to create their own segments, so collisions aren't going to be that big a deal in the Ethernet, fast Ethernet is where we are now world. Subnets, and what we want to do is to subnet our network so that we don't have the broadcast issues and we can isolate uh, different network components, areas, maybe work groups together so that they share a single network address, a single subnet address. So in our case, we actually put a subnet in each room. The reason is we get the isolation that we need for students. We used to have an issue when we were all on the same network that the, that the more mature, not really mature in, in actions, but the ones that have been there longer, love to do really neat, clever things to the ones that are just getting there, like get onto their machines and, and do nasty stuff to them. Once we created the subnets, they can no longer see those machines, so we don't really have that issue anymore. Wireless segmentation can be accomplished through adding access points. The devices serviced by separate access points are not strictly sharing the same media uh, because they go back. Remember, an access point is essentially a hub. Only one device can be using it at a time, unlike a switch where we can have multiple connections to it. Uh, smaller segments for security when we do these things and, and we can manage them better and we actually get better access to it because we are get off of the wireless and onto the wired from different things. In this one, go back to my drawing, uh, an AP, a couple of APs here. So each of these is going to service its own uh, system. Segmentation by adding access points. These laptops are going to be connected to their own SSIDs, which then are going to be wired into the wired network, obviously, and be able to get to the file servers. The PC can get back to the wireless devices should it need to do that. Can be created using bridges, switches, and routers, and I think I probably already have covered most of that, uh, either when we talked about these things earlier or in the uh, in the previous uh, video. Firewall 
sometimes called a packet filter. There's a number of different firewalls. We think about the firewall as probably as the uh, TCP IP filter. We also have uh, an application level firewall proxy server, something that can be very useful in the system itself. But what a firewall is designed to do is to prevent it says malicious packets from entering the network or computer. If we tell it it's okay, they're going to enter the. It, what it does is creates creates a situation, prevents somebody from establishing a connection on our network. It's kind of like your house. If you have locks on your door, it's going to keep people out. We hope doors and windows. We can think about as the entry ports. But if we allow somebody into the house then they can go ahead and see what's there or maybe actually take something or do damage to us. Same thing happens in a network. A firewall won't keep out a virus if a user actually installs a virus on the machine. And typically outbound packets are allowed, inbound packets are not allowed. So when you're doing the firewall you may want to consider limiting what goes out also so that you become less susceptible to these kind of devices. But a firewall can be hardware or software based and the, the new Windows machines, Windows 7 in particular, has a pretty good firewall. It can be configured, the advanced firewall, you can configure it down to the port so it actually will filter just like a big time firewall, a hardware firewall. And if you install an application and you have the firewall turned on, you install an application that needs to get through the firewall, it'll ask you for permission to do that. Please don't be like the clickies that just say yes to everything. When you get these pop-ups reading and that, see what it's asking you, what you want it to do. Two types of firewalls are going to be stateless and stateful. Stateless just looks at the incoming packet and permits and, and permits or denies it based upon a rule base. This is very difficult to control because if we go to the internet, the firewall in a stateless system doesn't know where we're going. It just knows that it allowed to pack it out. So what we're going to have to do is allow like port 80 in for every address in the world. Not a real good filtering process there. So stateless firewalls and most firewalls today are not stateless. This is just showing a firewall router, uh, a hard, hardware firewall position in the network. Uh, honestly, what we use is a little bit different than this one. What we actually do in most of our cases is we'll have a router out here, a filter router, a DMZ in here where the the machines that everybody needs to be able to get to can, a DMZ here, and then an internal router here on the other side of the firewall. Depends upon how you want to do it. Any of these systems will work as long as you know what you've got and know what you're managing. The other thing, I'll go back to this one, says stateless firewall. The other type of firewall we have is a stateful firewall which actually records the outbound packets that says that I'm going to www.yahoo.com and waits for the answer to come back. And if an answer comes back from google.com, it says, no, 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 you didn't initiate that connection. When the answer comes back from yahoo.com, it says, okay, somebody asked for that, I'm going to send it back to the uh, machine that's in my state table to get it to that information. So the stateless firewall, packet filtering rule, something like that, and we're going to get to the stateful firewall here in just a second. Stateful keeps a record of the state, and the firewalls are a, are a critical tool for protecting wireless, obviously. Uh, one of the issues with wireless, again, is it's not wired, so we can get the signal outside of our protected network. Many security experts maintain that the wireless AP should be treated as insecure and placed outside the firewall. What it does is a source address, the source IP is that of the web server on the internet because we can't know in advance what it's going to be. The destination IP address is the internal address. Is the internal address. Did the computer initiate the contact, which we talked about before? So we send a uh, request 
to the internet to a machine we go out and when we go out our state table records the fact that we requested something. When the answer comes back it's checked at the state table if it's in the state table then the answer comes back to us. If it's not in the state table then we're going to uh, reject it. Going to send it right back out into the ether. So stateful, stateless firewall, stateful. I think everything now is a stateful firewall. This is the if we're going to make the uh, wireless insecure and put it outside of the network we're going to have some issues depending on how we configure this thing and any time that you put any kind of a hole in your firewall you've created a risk where we have an issue getting to the internal resources which typically is what we want to do with these things. Now if you only want these users to access the internet, which you may be, this may be one of those networks that you don't want them on your internal network, this would work very nicely to do that. So we don't allow them on the internal network, only allow them to uh, have access to the, to the internet. The DMZ, we've kind of talked about a separate network that sits outside the secure network. It's between the, and what we, uh, what kind of we have, I have some pictures here in a minute, uh, a filter router and the firewall that allows us in. Outside users can access the DMZ but can't enter the secure network. May not be practical for a Soho network, although most of the Soho, the small office, home office networks home networks have a DMZ connection which allows you to connect one machine as a DMZ. What the DMZ is designed for is to allow anybody to get to a few resources on our network but to keep them out of our private network. <clears throat> NAT replaces, and I think I'm going to have a, a slide here in a minute that shows that, NAT actually replaces the actual source IP address with another IP address. This is going to be from a private to a public. What we typically use in our networks is going to be PAT port address translation, where instead of having a one-to-one -one private to public correlation, and that's what NAT requires, is we would have a single IP address, which probably you and I use, and it then gets our private addresses get translated to our public address and you can find out what that is by going to something like whatismyip.com and they use port numbers so we create a PAT table and that table so that when the information comes back it actually gets sent back to the correct machine so private addresses are designed to be used only on the private internal networks. They're not supposed to be routable on the internet. They should not be routed on the internet. Uh, this thing just shows that it's enabled a DMZ here. Nothing really dramatic. This is on the Linksys that we've been using. This is a picture of what would be, I think, the small office home office. We have the internet here comes into our firewall router firewall, most of the home office ones are, are and it has a multi-leg, one that's going to go to our internal router if we have an internal router and a, another leg that goes up to a, a router here and we have our resources that we want everybody to get to that said web, web server and maybe an email server that we want everybody to get, be able to get to and we have stopped now access of the bad guys to our private network. This is a picture, maybe a little bit more of a conventional uh, DMZ. Get back to making my bad drawings again. We come in from the internet, the untrusted network, through our perimeter firewall. We may allow 
you know, in this case, it's going to be a state with firewall, so any states that have been uh, initiated are going to be allowed through. And we're going to allow everybody to get to our DMZ servers, what we may have here again, a web server, email server, something like that, DNS server. And we're going to prevent those users from getting into our private network. We're probably going to allow our private guys out to need to be able to get to the DMZ and get to the Internet. So we have set this up. Depending on the equipment that you have, you may have a, a firewall that has a firewall physical device that has a third leg for the DMZ, or you may create your own DMZ. All these guys up here are going to be on a switch to allow them to do those things. NAT, the private address, can't be used on the Internet. And we've talked about these before when using NAT. The private address is assigned to a network device internally, the port address translation, if we have a single address, and um, then we use ports instead of addresses. This is a chart of the private IP addresses, the, the Class A network, the 10 network, the Class B, the 172.16 to 172.31.255.255. Two it's going to have a different mask, uh, and then the Class C is the 192.168 with a 255.255 mask to allow us to use these internally on our networks with no cost. When we translate them to the public addresses, they're now routable on the Internet. And this is a situation here. Let me get, let me get, my, get, me get, my, get my bad pen out here. The sender IP 192.168.0.3 is the original address. Uh, the alias address, the sender IP 192, what, it, what we do, the alias address or the natted address is we replace the IP in the header with that address. And it goes out on the Internet as the natted address. When it comes back, we reverse the NAT, obviously, and then the information goes back to the system that actually asks for it. If we're using PAT, we replace it with an alias address and a port. And when it comes back to the table, it gets sent back again to the place where we use it. The NAT advantages security conserves IP addresses segmentation. NAT is what's kept us in the IPv4 world for an awful long time. Without it, we would have run out of IP addresses a long time ago. But now you can run a relatively large network. You could probably pat around 200 devices. So instead of having to buy 200 individual IP addresses, you can buy one in either NAT or PAT. Or if you buy the 200, if you buy, if you have 300 computers and you buy 300 addresses, then you can NAT them. If you don't want to buy the 300 addresses, then you can buy fewer and use a port address translation. Disadvantages, uh, difficult troubleshooting, yeah, kind of, sort of. It's really not that bad. Pro problems with some applications can be an issue. A number of security uh, configurations are looking for something that is changing the IP address, and NAT will break a number of IPsec applications so that you may have some issues with those. So the security protocols can be an issue. Performance impact, a little bit, yeah, because any time that we manipulate the header, that we encrypt, any time that we do anything other than just send it away, it's going to take a little bit of time and a little bit of resource in order to manage the system. Virtual local area networks, logical grouping, what this is is creating virtual switches or segmenting a switch into a number of different blocks and then not allowing and having these blocks parts of a switch on different networks. And the only way that we can connect those things together is through a router. So the devices can be dispersed and they can be dispersed throughout the network so that we can have different uh, VLANs on different switches and we connect them together with what's called a trunk port which allows all of the VLANs on it. And when it gets to the switch, the information is only sent to the ports that are on that particular virtual local area network so that when we 
when we send the information it can go to multiple switches but only to specific devices on those multiple switches. Uh, VLAN multicast transmission is sent to a single device. The broadcast is sent to all the network devices on that VLAN. Broadcast domain, we've talked about those before, I think. Uh, the key VLAN is the ability of the switch to correctly direct the packets. And these are called tag packets in, in uh, many cases so that they have a tag that says which VLAN they're on and when it gets to the next switch it strips that off so that we don't send a packet to a machine that doesn't know how to handle because it's going to put a four byte uh, information in the middle of the of the data. 802.1Q is the standard. Cisco had ISL uh, before and they, they set up they were ahead of the game in VLANs and they had their own proprietary protocol for quite some time. So in this thing what we have is we have an Ethernet switch here going to hubs. We have collision domains. Each of these collision domains means that each of them is going to be on a different uh, port on the switch. Each port on the switch is going to be a collision domain. In a hub, a hub creates a single collision domain and that's why these up here on the hubs are a collision domain and each of these attached to a switch are in their own collision domain. When we do uh, VLANs we have broadcasts we break the switch up into different ports are going to be on different VLANs and it says broadcast from A and, they, and we can have VLANs on different switches we can have ports on different switches on the same VLAN so that we can actually distribute our network uh, pretty substantially. What that means is if we have a VLAN for uh, maybe accounting and then we need to move Joe from accounting to the third floor from the second floor we can put his computer on the, v, on the accounting VLAN and he'll be connected to the same network as all the rest of his VLAN or the rest of his accounting buddies. Uh, 802.1Q inserts a 4 byte tag header within the existing Ethernet frame and then the Cisco ISL was the original one. The new tag here, the 4 byte, goes into the middle. The ISL actually encapsulates a much, much larger uh, packet when we do these things. And Cisco has actually taken ISL out of the newer switches so it's something that's going away. The dot one Q is the standard that's being used on the Cisco switches as well as everybody else right now. And this is just the size of the frames. Well, the protocol identifier and the tag identifier to get to the four bytes. Cisco uses a 26 byte header field and a CRC of four bytes. So we have a 26 byte at the front end and a four byte at the, at the back end making it a much much larger packet. Wireless VLANs can be used to segment traffic and what we're going to do there is we'll have different SSIDs for the different uh, VLANs. Depends on the devices that separate them. Switch based configurations does not handle roaming users well when we do these things. AP configuration is responsible for separating the packets of different VLANs are transmitted by the AP on different SSIDs. So when we look at this picture here we have the accounting VLAN down here, accounting VLAN down here, and they're going to go up to the to the switch, and then we have the marketing VLAN over here that's going to go up to the switch. The switch, and then we'd have the marketing VLAN and the accounting VLAN. In the switch itself, we would have the different VLANs, and each of the de devices on their own port would be connected to that VLAN. The trunking would allow us to send all of the ports. So this one, the accounting VLAN, as they come out of this thing, they get a little mark on them and say, hey, I'm an accounting VLAN. Not really, but maybe I'm the red VLAN and I can only go to the red devices. And now let's, and now, 
the marketing VLAN is the blue VLAN and it can only go to the blue devices. If we wanted these guys to connect to each other, we would need a router in here that's connected to the switch in order to route the, the, the information from one to the other. In this one, we would have separate SSIDs. We have the accounting VLAN here and the accounting VLAN here, marketing VLAN over here, slow down, and the marketing VLAN over here. Not doing so well. So let's say that the marketing is the blue VLAN. It can go up here. It can talk to the marketing VLAN and it can talk to the marketing VLAN. Everything is on the blue ports, the marketing VLAN ports. If we we have a situation that we have the red ports here, the accounting VLAN can talk to, only talk to the accounting uh, members. And then again, if we wanted them to talk to each other, we would have to put a router in so that the information will get routed from one network to the other. And these things are going to be on different SSIDs and the SSIDs will be associated with different virtual local area networks. Many organizations set up two VLANs, employees and guests, and again most of the new maybe all of the new, I haven't actually checked all of them, the one that I bought did. Most of the new uh, access points actually have a guest and as I look around the neighborhood there's a lot of them that are advertising guest networks. So you can do that, you can isolate your guest, you can allow them to have access to your network or not allow them to have access to your network. Whatever you want to do with that. Wireless VLANs allow single access points to service both VLANs so that we can have in this case different encryption, different uh, security on each of these things. The uh, guests may be an open network but only is allowed access to the internet whereas the employee is a WPA2 enterprise. We're going to have to use a radius server to get authenticated and have uh, author authorization to actually connect to it with a certificate. For instance, we'll use certificate to authenticate the server and then we'll log on. Lots more security on it and it will go to different parts of our network. Hardware placement in a secure location is important for security. I talked about the one earlier where they actually reset it. You want these things out of the way, out of sight if at all possible. Keep in mind that you may need to use power over Ethernet because when we start talking about these things, we're probably going to be put them in places where there may or may not be uh, power outlets. So uh, power over Ethernet can be an issue. Fasten to a wall pole or a similar object to deter thieves. And there's lots of, of different new models that come out. I'm going to have some pictures of, of them here just in a second. Air handling space is used to circulate air. Be careful about putting them in there because if it burns up, you can now create a smoke screen throughout the building. Uh, can be a hazard. Be careful about those things. Here are some pictures of some of the access points. Move this one over here. Actually, we'll this one here. Different ones. Kind of just different pictures of what these things might look like. This go, replaces, obviously all of them replace a ceiling tile. Uh, if you go into a hotel, look around and you may see something mounted to the wall high up or something like this to replace a ceiling tile to, uh, to be our, uh, at, that are our actual access points. Hardware placement, this access point with a secure lock on it. This one over here on the right is put in here to kind of talk about polarization and orientation of the antennas and what happens to the signal. In this one, the, the antenna is vertical. The signal goes out. 
in this direction and this one is horizontal and it goes up and never the twain shall meet as we do these things. The polarization, the antenna position needs to be the same for the devices and that's what that one is all about. This one is to show that when we get into the uh, 2.4 gigahertz area we really only have three distinct channels. When you start putting multiple access points together you need to be sure that the channels don't overlap because if we put channel 1 to channel 1 they're going to interfere with each other. We want to isolate these things. And you note here that the 6's don't overlap with each other and we only have 111 in this thing so that we only allow different channels to overlap so that we minimize or eliminate interference. If you have to have some overlap put them as far apart as possible so that when you have the two channels if these actually bled over to each other you would want them far enough apart so that the signals would be as weak as possible. <clears throat> and on these floors we notice that going up if we have floor to floor you, you're going to need to be careful about that too in a multi-story multi building so that you don't want the same channels overlapping each other. Uh, security dev uh, the devices themselves shouldn't be overlapped. Uh, the wireless devices, personal firewall, antivirus, antispyware, patch software so that they're up to date, and tools that identify the new classes of attacks. Personal firewall, each device should have its own software firewall installed. On computers, there's lots of discussion, arguments. You can make cases for both. If you're inside a firewall, do you need the firewall on the machines enable? The answer is it's up to you. Keep in mind that if you do have the firewalls enabled, one of the things that's going to make, probably make it a little bit more difficult to do remote management, but at the same time, it's going to give you extra protection so that if one of those machines does get, does get compromised, it's not going to be able to have immediate access to everything else on the network. Just different things to, to think about. The double layer of protection if we have both firewalls enabled here personal firewalls close and hide the unused ports and again if you install a piece of software that needs to go through the firewall it'll ask you permission to do that so that you can get from you have control of, over what actually gets off of your machine out of your out of your firewall and they're all governed by rules and this is one this is one of the older ones obviously what are we going to allow if you look at the Windows 7 firewall it has a control right down to the port level let me bring in a Windows firewall here Windows 7 firewall if we go to inbound rules a number of different things what can go in what can not go in the little green check boxes are what's allowed for inbound connections on this network. Outbound rules, what can actually go out. Uh, DNS, DHCP, group policy, HTTPS. What do we want to allow? If we have something special, we can come in and create our own rules here. And again, if you don't want these little uh, uh, window on the right you can turn the windows off and on and you get more territory on your individual uh, window resource so we can we can have the those things antivirus software best defense against viruses obviously that is the case it, it can scan the computer uh, you need to set up a scan so that this happens regularly on your system the definitions have to be updated and the disadvantage is they can only find things that has a definition so if something's brand new the antivirus may not find it until you're already infected work with the uh, with the security center this is something that I found quite amazing 
and this is the and this this goes back a couple of years. This is for 2012, but the average percentage of computers that were unprotected in the second half of 2012. Canada is 23%, the U.S. 26%, Brazil 21%, U.K. 21%, Egypt 40%, India 30%, and you can look at what's going on in Russia, 29%. So there are lots of people out there that really aren't using antivirus softwares, and that's why viruses become effective. This is just a picture of the of the Symantec management console. Scan the computer. Every one of them is going to be a little bit different, but you really do need to have one of these things. Anti-spyware, probably not quite as onerous as uh, a virus, but infected by different types of spyware that are going to try to discern patterns. Uh, a lot of them are used to send you targeted ads. What are you actually doing in the system? Or to give you these annoying pop-up ads that you really don't want. Uh, similar to antivirus software, there's anti-spyware software. It's got to be updated regularly. Uh, needs to be run on a regular basis to check the machine. Uh, continuous real-time monitoring performs a complete scan, uh, just like an antivirus real-time real monitoring on the system. Uh, tracks eraser, browser restore, a number of different things that are available in them. Patch software, security updates. Uh, Windows up until several years ago now used to update things on a regular basis as they occurred. In today's world, we have Patch Tuesday, the second Tuesday, I think it is, of each month is when Microsoft sends them out. Unless something's really, really, really bad, and then they'll have an out-of-band, what's called an out-of-band update, that they send it out immediately. Generally designed to fix security vulnerabilities. The thing to keep in mind here is if the vulnerability, if the patch has gone out and you didn't install it, you are now more vulnerable than you were before the patch because what the patch allows the bad guys to do is to reverse engineer it. Once it's reverse engineered, they know what it's designed to counteract. And if you have not installed the patch and they find out you haven't installed the patch, then they know better how to attack your system. The Microsoft classifications of these things. And this is this is an unreadable Microsoft patch. This is at the Microsoft Help and Support website that you can get information about these things. Configure the system to check for updates. You can check for updates every day. Unless there's something out of band it's only going to install uh, once a month and that's okay. If it's really bad it'll come out. It'll do that. Probably want to configure it to allow the system to download and install the patches automatically. I put in the uh, update here. This is what the Windows 7 one looks like. We have the options to install updates automatically, download updates, let me choose when to install them, um, check for updates or never. Never is not recommended, not a good idea. Probably want to install the up new updates in whatever time of day you pick. The reason I pick 6 is when this machine comes on. Give me the recommended updates. The same way I receive important updates, uh, who can install anybody, and that's a change from earlier versions where only administrators could install updates. For Microsoft products, so that if you have Office, that gets installed also. also for Microsoft soft when new Microsoft software is available, so. You really want that configured to do automatic updates for the system. This is a Windows XP, I think, uh, system that that does those. Rootkit detectors. Rootkits are something that are really not very nice. Software tools that attackers use to break into a computer is a rootkit. What this thing does is is it get operating system privileges and performs unauthorized functions. It hides the tools that are attacking us. I guess one of the more famous root kits was the one that Sony gave people who bought their some of their uh, d CDs, and they put a root kit on to keep you from making a copy of the CD. Not a real smart thing for a system to do. There are root kit detection software, and you should 
use those whenever you need them so that you can you can do that and a lot of that's going to be boot to actually there are several of those available the root kit doesn't cause any direct damage but the fundamental problem with detecting root kits is the user can can no longer trust the operating system because what it's doing is substituting itself as something into the in the operating system and that's where signed files come in handy uh, Microsoft's gone more and more and more to that there are programs available to do that uh, it can be difficult a lot of times you're gonna have to for a number of these things you're gonna have to boot to a, a live CD DVD uh, USB drive in order to get rid of the files because you have a very difficult time getting rid of an open file in the Windows system. So most of them reformat the hard drive and reinstall the operating system and this is a little that depends on reformatting the operating system. How did you actually put the operating system in? If you mixed everything into a single partition then you're going to destroy all your data at the same time. If you partitioned your system so that the operating system is separate from everything else you can do that and then reinstall your uh, applications and it probably should work pretty well. So at the end of the five security principles the layering, limiting, diversity, obscurity, and simplicity segment your networks and probably segment them at layer three with subnets is a, is a good way to do that. Layer 3 switches really can help you out an awful lot there. VLANs can isolate different work groups from other work groups. Is it going to stop everything completely? Absolutely not. Will it help? Yeah, it's part of the layering or the defense in depth when we do these things. The security and wireless devices, the firewalls, antivirus, and a spyware uh, patch software and rootkit detectors, all of those things should be used, can be used, that we should use each of those in the proper defending of the network. And, and a lot of that's true not just for wireless devices, but for devices in general. With that, thank you for watching, and I hope this has been useful.